I'm Max Blumenthal, and we're here with my colleague, Aaron Mate, the so-called buzzsaw. He's been demonstrating that throughout this stream. And uh, we got Ray McGovern, our I think he's our favorite former CIA officer, uh, former <laughs> analyst, former briefer to uh, Max, AFK, can I say LBJ. one more thing? Well, we're on, we're on to the next segment now. So on okay, this con no problem. On, so we're going to, we're going to address and, and, and then you can, you can work in the, you can work in anything you want here, but we're going to address the demise of Nina Jankowitz. Uh, I really uh, can't say her name or think about her without holding back laughter. Uh, the department of Homeland security and it's extraordinarily serious secretary, Alexander Mayorkas, appointed a certifiable lunatic and pathological liar to lead an initiative that she apparently helped design called the Disinformation Governance Board, which was accurately described by critics as a kind of ministry of truth. Because what Nina Jankowitz had been doing throughout her career, uh, aside from being this a kind of regime change operative, and we'll talk about that, is <laughs> to weaponize the concept of disinformation against her foes who happen to be the same foes of the kind of US national security state and democratic party elite. Uh, therefore, defining themselves as the arbiters of truth. And she's attacked the gray zone as a spreader of disinformation. Um, we'll get into that, but I wanna first just lead with a, a few clips of Nina Jankowitz on her uh, farewell tour. I don't know if we're going to be hearing much from her again, uh, but she's really, uh, I don't know, maybe she has a career out there in Broadway or off Broadway, but she's really trying to stoke sympathy for herself. And unfortunately and ironically, we were undone exactly by a disinformation campaign coming from folks who apparently want to put our national security behind their own personal political ambition. So they fell victim. So the, the disinformation governance board fell victim to disinformation. So obviously they weren't very effective. I mean, I, I don't know. I can't think of a good analogy right now, but it's one of the funniest things I've ever heard. And I mean, you just look at her for one second and you can see that she, she just, she, there's just something that isn't right there. Um, Before she, came out with that talking point about that she was the victim of disinformation. I wish she had thought about how that looks. If you're claiming to be the authority to police disinformation, what does it say if you can't even refute disinformation about yourself and your disinformation board? If you can't even rebut that properly, what gives you the right to and the and the license to try to refute disinformation elsewhere if you can't even refute disinformation about yourself? It just it's not it doesn't it doesn't compute. I wish she had thought about that before trying to portray herself as a victim. Now here she is again, portraying herself as a victim on on Chris Hayes, uh, Rachel Maddow impersonator Chris Hayes. What was the experience of being the focal point of this sort of like massive frenzy like <laughs> over the last few weeks? Well, it, it was really overwhelming, Chris. I mean, frankly, you know, I have prided myself over my career of being a really nuanced, uh, reasonable person. Again, as I said, I've, I've we've got to play that again. You know, I have prided myself over my career of being a really nuanced, uh, reasonable person. Again, as I said, I've I've briefed and advised both Republicans and Democrats. I admire some of the steps that the Trump administration even took to combat disinformation, including Senator Rob Portman and his bills against deep fakes and, you know, funding the global engagement center at this okay so what she's saying she's trying to seem nonpartisan by saying that she works with the uniparty uh she works with the republicans who are the same pro-war imperialist republicans as the democrats and she's supported their effort to start a domestic propaganda minis uh cut out within the state department called the global engagement center so that doesn't really stand at odds with the portrayal of her as a professional propagandist. State Department. So to say that I'm just a partisan actor was was wildly out of context. And then beyond that, it wasn't just, you know, these mischaracterizations of, of my work, but it was death threats against my family. Over the last three weeks, I have maybe had one or two days I didn't report a violent threat, something like, we're coming for you and your family. You and your family should be sent to Russia to be killed. Encourage me and me to commit suicide. That sounds like what she said about us, but. Um, all of those have been forwarded to the Department of Homeland Security. 
security security, uh, security services. services. And, you know, and, that's, you know that's, that's, not, that's not something, uh, that, is American, something that is American. That is not how, that is not how we should be, should be acting when we have disagreements about policy in this country. I think we need to learn how to be adults in the room. And I don't have time for this childishness. I'm not going to let it silence me. I'm going to go forward and continue building awareness about this threat. So, yeah, we have to be adults in the room. We'll see. We'll see what an adult what kind of an adult she is. Uh, but one of the most uh, upsetting components of this whole Nina Jankowitz saga was how not only the New York Times, but the Washington Post went to bat for her and defended her. And of course, it was up to Taylor Lorenz, who's this kind of professional kind of uh, her, her, her whole career has been punching down and defending established power. And that's what she did with Nina Jankowitz, where she portrayed all the criticism of Nina Jankowitz as a right-wing campaign of hatred and disinformation. As if there were not people on the left or anti-war critics who had pointed out, for example, us, that Nina Jankowitz was attacking us with disinformation. And I'll just throw up like one one uh, example of that on screen, but here's Nina Jankowitz tweeting in September on September 1st, 2020, Gray Zone creates their own hysteria and, and spreads incredibly damaging disinformation. It calls popular protests color revolutions. Oh my God, you know, they call themselves color revolutions. Have you ever heard of the orange revolution? That wasn't us. We didn't make it up. The tulip revolution, whatever they, that, that was this their thing. That was your thing. And papers over Stalinist crimes against humanity. They are not a reputable source on, quote unquote, countering Russian hysteria. Um, and she subsequently accused us, and Aaron, you can address this, of being part of a Russian influence operation without any evidence whatsoever. Um, so she straight up smeared us. I mean, that's, that's a straight up libel. She's also spread the phony, now completely discredited lie that the Hunter Biden laptop was a Russian disinformation plant. She has actually been a member of the Integrity Initiative, which was itself a disinformation operation run by British military intelligence to penetrate the media and spread Russia hysteria to drive military budgets up in preparation for the kind of war with Russia that's taking place in Ukraine. And she has blocked all of us preemptively. I, I didn't even know she'd said that about us until she was appointed to the DHS board. So she preemptively blocked us while attacking us and says that she's, uh, she's tough. She can take it. Um, I mean, there's just so many levels of fraud and dishonesty here. Uh, either of you can jump in and address this if you want, and then we can put up some more examples on, we can, we can display some more examples of disinformation from the dis the supposed counter disinformation experts. The problem here, uh, of course, is that no one is ever held accountable. You can slander people, you can try to ostracize them, you can put them or try to put them in jail for the rest of their lives for telling the truth, as you're doing with Julian Assange, and no one is held accountable. Uh, it goes back uh, in my in my gaze here to Iraq. Um, Fred Hyatt. Now he died six months ago, and people say you're not supposed to say anything bad about the dead. Uh, I'm going to claim a waiver here. He was up page editor for the Washington Post before Iraq. Uh, he ran about 100 articles saying there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, flat fact. And uh, actually, after they were, it was discovered there were none, he's up at the Columbia School of Journalism. And he's relaxed. He's had a little drink there. And then and that one of the students says, now, uh, Mr. Fred Hyatt, um, you, you kept saying that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq before the war, uh, you asserted that as flat fact, all your contributors said, so what, what are we to make of that? And Hyatt looked down and he said, well, he said, uh, you know, um, if it wasn't true that there were WMD in Iraq, we probably 
shouldn't have said there were. <laughs> now, Bob Perry told me that. And it's in the Columbia School Review magazine. And when Bob says, you know, Ray, as I recall, it's sort of a cardinal principle of journalism. If something's not really true, you're not supposed to say that it's true. Do you get that, Ray? I said, yeah. So this is kind of a ludicrous example and a sad example because, you know, most people say, well, Hyatt must have been fired after that, uh, that uh, adventurism or that adventure. Uh, but no, no, that was 2002. He remained as head of the op-ed page in the Washington Post until he died in 2001. So it's a long time to stay in, in place. Why? He's rewarded. He was so, so all I'm saying is that there's got to be some way and maybe, maybe uh, Durham, uh, John Durham, the special prosecutor, uh, we'll be able to adduce enough facts here that at least some of these journalists who are in bed with the, the Comeys and the, and the Andy McCabe's and the John Brennan's of this world, that they will not be able to escape uh, being held accountable. I'm not holding my breath, but let's give that a chance. Well, for Fred Hyatt was one of the worst purveyors of pro-war disinformation. The Washington Post op-ed Editorial board under his watch supported every war, every regime change operation, every effort to sanction independent countries in the global south. It was it, it just the most reliable, never critical voice of the war state. And also, Fred Hyatt basically hosted a like de facto parlor room of neocons at the editorial board just every week just churning out the propaganda so uh, uh, he of course he's rewarded for a job well done the same way jeffrey goldberg was who helped uh provide disinformation about saddam hussein's connection to al-qaeda on two occasions his propaganda the propaganda he published in the new yorker was cited by none other than dick cheney then during the Obama era, <laughs> Jeffrey Goldberg was spreading Netanyahu's disinformation. He was a channel for disinformation for Netanyahu, that Israel was due to attack Iran at any minute unless the U.S. would actually strike the reactor at Natanz and, and start attacking Iran. Because, of course, Israel mm. couldn't do it. Israel didn't have the capacity. So Jeffrey Goldberg's role was to spread disinformation, and he was appointed by billionaire David Bradley as editor-in-chief of The Atlantic to continue doing that job. So Nina Jankowitz comes from that class, Aaron. Uh, what was your reaction to her appointment and her demise? Well, what I'm worried about is because she was such a clownish, ridiculous figure that her own personal quirks are going to overshadow the, the real implications of, what, of her project. And the project remains. Michael Chertoff former DHS secretary under Bush, he's been appointed now basically as the de facto head of this disinformation board as they figure out what to do with it. And Nina Jankowitz, when she would talk about what she wanted to do with it, her proposals included she wanted to be able to um, give certain users on Twitter, people like her, the power to, ed to edit other people's tweets. So for to provide context that she yeah, me, deemed to be missing. Let me let me let me play a clip of her um, saying that because it's really interesting. But this is from the New York Times article on with the most hilarious headline: "A panel to combat disinformation becomes a victim of it," um, <laughs> which <laughs> it, I mean, it just says so much, including that the New York Times sees the definition of disinformation as anything that upends the objectives of the establishment or the security state. But Chertoff is mentioned sort of as a footnote here. Um, I mean, this is amazing that Michael Chertoff has been appointed by the Biden administration to reconstruct the Ministry of Truth. Uh, you know, Ray or Aaron, who is who is Michael Chertoff? What is wrong with this name here? I think we we can't just gloss that over. Well, he had, he headed up the Department of Homeland Security himself, if memory serves. Um, uh, he he was uh, guilty of all kinds of uh, malfeasance and misfeasance, 
and he made a lot of money. I think, uh, yeah, he decided that he'd go into the business of making uh, uh, detectors for for airports. Right. <laughs> and right. he made a fortune on that kind of stuff. I mean, the guy is typical of uh, what you run into at that level in Washington. Um, and to see him now, as you point out, uh, in a position of, of responsibility to take this this cudgel up and make it work, and be able to uh, to edit our our tweets, my <laughs> God, you know, it's it's uh, it's hard to believe, but more easy to believe as the years go by. Yeah. Uh, 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 Michael Chertoff was a supporter of torture. He helped uh, lie the U.S. into the war in Iraq, one of the greatest disinformation campaigns in history. As you mentioned, he uh, the Chertoff group was basically uh, a lobbying firm for security contractors or manufacturers of security devices like a, uh, hot, a radiation-emitting a uh, substitute for the old fashioned metal detector as airports began to be hyper securitized after 9-11. So, I mean, he was basically advancing major conflicts of interest in the name of security. He's a deeply corrupt individual and the department of Homeland security. I don't even know why it exists. It's just a perfect example of the blob. Um, but here's an example. Here's the, the um, clip that Aaron was referring to where Nina Jankowitz calls for trustworthy people to essentially be able to edit other people's tweets. Um, and I am eligible for it because I'm verified, but there are a lot of people who shouldn't be verified who aren't, you know, legit in my opinion. I mean, they are real people, but they're not um, trustworthy. Anyway, so verified people <laughs> that would be can, us. Um, essentially start to edit Twitter the, the same sort of way that Wikipedia is so they can add context to certain tweets. Um, so just as a easy example, not from any political standpoint, if president Trump were still on Twitter and tweeted a claim about voter fraud, someone could add context from one of the 60 lawsuits, uh, that went through the court or, uh, something that an election official in one of the States said, perhaps your own secretary of state, uh, <laughs> and, and his news conferences, something like that adding context so that people um, have a fuller picture rather than just an individual claim on a tweet. By the way, I love the lady sitting alone. Um, I love the lady sitting alone in the middle in a room completely by herself with a mask on uh, or two of them. I, I don't know if you can catch anything <laughs> from digital disinformation. Um, but uh, I mean, what, what, here, where, where's Aaron? Aaron's Aaron. What was wrong with her statement? I mean, what's wrong I mean, with that? This is, I mean, this is her agenda. She wants to be able to silence dissenting voices. And I don't think this plan of, for example, being able to edit other people's tweets and, you know, uh, take away people's verification, all that stuff. I don't think it goes away with her. I think this is the new playbook. Um, Consortium News just today uh, has an article out where they say that the Victoria Newland phone call, uh, a recording of the Victoria Newland phone call where she's caught plotting with the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine on installing the next Ukrainian government uh, back right before the coup of 2014. The video of that has been removed from YouTube entirely. The, the fullest version of that clip along with the transcript, YouTube just pulled it uh, offline today. And um, this, to me, is where we're headed. You know, Nina Jankowicz wants to be able to do stuff like this, police other people's tweets, uh, take them, you know, ban them, obviously. So many, so many dissenting voices on the Ukraine proxy war have just been taken off of Twitter. Uh, she's talked about us as if we're part of a Russian uh, influence operation, which is a complete, obvious fabrication. She has talked about, um, while meanwhile, you know, promoting claims that actually cover up war crimes. This isn't just about policing dissenting voices. This also is about uh, covering up for crimes. Like, for example, the one I'm, I'm particularly occupied with is Duma, April 2018, where Syria was accused of a chemical attack. And then the US, France, and Britain bombed Syria based on that, on that allegation. And then the OPCW, the world's top chemical weapons watchdog, released a report about a year later aligning with the US-led narrative that Syria was guilty of a chemical attack. 
But then we got these leaks from the actual OPCW inspectors who went on the ground in Duma. And those leaks showed us that these inspectors found no evidence of a chemical attack, but their investigation was censored and doctored. And so we were never meant to see what these inspectors had actually found. And people like Nina Jankowitz has promoted the official narrative on Duma, which essentially is covering up for how these people in Duma were really killed, were, were really killed. Because if it wasn't a chemical attack, then they must have died in some other way. And they must have been killed or their bodies must have been used by the insurgents who put out these videos falsely claiming that it was a chemical attack to cover up for the fact that they were staging one. And so she's called for um, people that challenge, that basically report on the OPCW leaks like we do at the Gray Zone. She's essentially called for us to be censored. And that's what I'm concerned about, is that since these leaks, like those of the OPCW, are so damning, are we going to get to a point where we're not even allowed to discuss them on social media? I mean, that's if the vision of people like her is carried forward, that's the scenario that we're headed towards, I think. Well, just to, just to, about that, about the clip of Nina Jankowitz calling for the editing of Twitter by trustworthy people. This is how Wikipedia functions as a bulletin board and dis and okay. defamation site for the establishment, the kind of people gathered right now in Davos at the World Economic Forum, as well as the national security elite. You can just go take a look at my Wikipedia page and who's editing it. It's someone Ray might be familiar with. Uh, and I, I want to say his name, but I don't think, you know, there's even a pronoun I can put before a, uh, what appears to be an intelligence operation. It's some thing called Philip Cross that is allowed by Wikipedia to edit over 50% of my page and just vandalize it and make me look like, uh, you know, the worst Holocaust denier who's ever lived, not just like an okay Holocaust denier, but the worst Holocaust <laughs> denier, the worst uh, liar. All of my achievements have been removed. Anyone who thinks like us gets vandalized by Philip Cross. And these editors are a cartel of centrist extremists who are empowered by Jimmy Wales, the CEO of Wikipedia, and the Wikimedia Foundation, which is funded by various you know, intelligence and national security state cutouts. Jimmy Wales is on the board of an organization called NewsGuard. And NewsGuard approached the gray zone. Many of you watching this might be familiar with my response to them. And I'll, I'll put up their entry. We just got their, their article on us. They're an organization that includes Tom Ridge, the first DHS director on their board, uh, alongside Michael Hayden, someone I'm sure Ray has a lot to say about, uh, former CIA and NSA director, and uh, former uh, head of the State Department Global Engagement Center, Richard Stengel, who described himself as the U.S. chief propagandist. And what they do is they do media ratings, where they give you a green or red label based on their assessment of your trustworthiness. Of somehow they managed to give CNN a green label and the Washington Post and all of our uh, truthy friends. And we just got the, the red label that I expected. So when they approached me, I said, I can't wait to get your red label. It will be a red badge of honor for me uh, because you're a collection of spooks, war criminals, and pathological liars who are responsible for some of the worst disinformation campaigns that have killed millions of people around the world. I would be happy to have you denigrate us. So I got their assessment and their assessment of us really was a window into the mindset of the people who claim to be fighting disinformation. They said that the worst thing about the gray zone was that we lie. We just don't tell the truth because we claim that what happened in Ukraine between 2013 and 2014 that saw a change in government was a US backed regime change operation or even a coup. So that's our first lie. They said that we challenge the official OPCW version of Duma, the Duma attack in April 2018, uh, and point to uh, additional versions of the events by dissenters from within the OPCW. So that's another lie. And that we uh, question the U.S. role in Venezuela and on and on and on. So any divergence from the official national security state's version of major geopolitical events makes you a liar according to NewsGuard. And therefore, we will not be allowed on any Microsoft produced computer, which is in public libraries because they have a deal with NewsGuard and NewsGuard 
is actually funded by Microsoft, as well as the notorious truth spreaders at the Department of Defense, which has contributed $800,000 to NewsGuard. So we got a rating of something like 17.5 out of 100, a massive F from these people. We are red. Uh, but this is the beginning of a process and an attempt to deplatform the gray zone. Ray, have you encountered any sort of attempts to denigrate your reputation by these same elements? Uh, do you, what do you think of your own Wikipedia page? Well, you know, I've uh, not looked at my own Wikipedia page for seven, eight years. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's been I, when your I saw what they put up about Russiagate, I said, well, you know, this is this is a joke. Anybody who wants to know something about me should go to raymcgovern.com or I do have a my website where I have a bio. Uh, and if they're not serious, they can believe uh, what Wiki, uh, Wikipedia says. You know, it's very, very troubling. I mean, uh, we can laugh and all that. And maybe I'm getting a little bit, uh, well, what they say about me, uh, what they say about me is the first instance true. They say, ah, he's an old guy. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm an old guy. All right. I'm still more compass mentis, I claim, than many other people around, including the President of the United States. Uh, but I'm an old guy. So then they say, so what can he know? He hasn't had access to classified information for years and years, okay? As if, <laughs> as if you can't really know anything or analyze anything unless you have access to classified information. Now, very briefly, my favorite story about that is when Bill Casey came in to head up the CIA under Ronald Reagan, the first thing he said at the first cabinet meeting, is says, you know, I just in for a big surprise. I found out that 80% of the information used by my Russian analysts is from open sources, from newspapers and books and, and speeches. <laughs> my God, got to be some spies to be worth anything. <laughs> well, he learned gradually, but, you know, 80% of the information we needed was available from, from open sources. Every now and then it was nice to have an intercept or, or a, a satellite photo that, uh, that confirmed what you had already reason to. So, you know, what you can glean from, from the internet or from anywhere, now it's 90%. Do, do I lust for, a, for an intercept the conversation? Every now and then I would really like to have it, but I usually get it from Aaron or from you in some other form. So in, in other words, the way they try to denigrate me is to say, number one, he's a little guy, that happens to be true. And number two, they say, well, he can't possibly make any judgments uh, without access to uh, classified information. And of course, as we've discussed Russiagate, as uh, we've discussed, we haven't talked about Afghanistan, and we wrote an article to Obama saying, once he decided to bow to the wishes of the military and Bobby Gates, uh, we said, uh, welcome to our, welcome to Vietnam, Mr. President, okay? And that was really early on. So you can get, you can get, if you have a, if you have the persistence and if you have basic tools of media analysis, you can make cogent judgments based on what's available. And we veteran intelligence professionals for sanity stand by our record. And, um, and all I can say is that uh, the challenge is to be able to find some way to rebut people who accuse Aaron of disagreeing with what the UN said or disagreeing with what people said about Duma. Well, you know, every now and then you can bring the principles of physics to bear on these things. And that's what those honest OPCW um, inspectors did. And not only they, but Ted Postal. And, you know, if, if it defies the laws of physics, that's probably not true. And not only that, but Russiagate, the, the, the hacking, defied the laws of physics. <laughs> As we pointed out on December 12, 2016, very early on. So it's uh, people are very credulous. And when they like Rachel Maddow and uh, that guy, what's his name? The fellow who was uh, uh, Chris Hayes, you know, 
<laughs> I mean, I thought I saw him suppressing a smile barely, uh, but you know, he's, he's bright enough to know better and they do it anyway. And that's what makes an impact on the people who make judgments to the degree they make judgments. Well, he's Speaking Chris Hayes. Judgments, go ahead, Mike. Go ahead, Aaron. Uh, I, well, I, I was gonna, uh, no, I was going to say, making, no, you were going to say, no, I was, uh, <laughs> on the issue of, of, of making judgments, Max, you mentioned Venezuela before. And what I would say to NewsGuard for, you know, attacking us for how we cover Venezuela is read Mark Esper's new book. Uh, he was Trump's defense secretary. His memoir is crazy. Some of the stuff he talks about. So at the time of the coup, the gray zone was on the ground in Venezuela, pointing out that the Trump administration was behind a coup. Juan Guaido was a puppet. And, you know, we were talking about these attacks going on on civilian infrastructure looking pretty suspicious and looking like that's a part of a U.S. effort to destabilize Venezuela and, you know, care, you know, push forward the overthrow of Maduro. Well, what does Mark Esper say in his new book? He says that there were discussions inside the White House of carrying out attacks on Venezuelan civilian infrastructure, uh, mil you know, military attacks. Even there was talk even of an invasion. Juan Guaido asked Trump to invade. And Trump said to him, like, wouldn't it be better if you guys did it? We just support you. And Juan Guaido was like, you know what? No, it'd be a lot quicker and easier if you guys did it. And Esper, <laughs> says, Esper says there were even discussions of establishing a Contra-like dirty war, the same thing that the Reagan administration did in Nicaragua. There were discussions, which Esper appeared to support, of uh, organizing a Contra army to terrorize Venezuelan civilians. So all the things that we talked about or were speculating about back then proved to be corroborated later on by the people who are carrying out the policies. Esper's book has gotten a lot of attention, but not for that, which to me is the most explosive part. And there's also another thing, you know, Max, the first time I heard of your reporting was back in 2005 or something. And that was when you did a long series about the U.S. role in the coup in Haiti. And I was particularly, I was particularly interested in that because that's how I basically started out in journalism is covering Canada's role in the February 2004 overthrow of Jean-Bertrand Aristide. And... At the time, all sorts of people would attack us for, you know, uh, saying that this was a coup. The U.S. was central, centrally involved. And what just happened in, in The New York Times? There was that long series on how much, you know, Western colonial powers have stolen from Haiti, especially France and the U.S. And buried at the bottom is an admission by the former French ambassador to Haiti at the time who says, yes, this was a coup orchestrated by the Bush administration. And oh, so that's coming that. what? That's this is now 18 years later. Yeah. Um, but the truth eventually gets out, you know, eventually after many years. But the problem we face is that we're actually saying the truth at the time that it's happening. And that's why people want to, want to shut us up is because it can be said years after the fact. You, you can do sort of like nostalgia adversarial journalism and talk about crimes of the past. But when they're actually happening, that's a no-no. Yeah. Well, uh, w one last point of uh someone trying to shut us up you tweeted about this um that i want you to address aaron is uh the british trotskyist paul mason who basically called for state action against us because we don't tow the party line on the nato proxy war in ukraine uh, he named us he called us out and he said, we need state action to challenge the hate speech, lies and threats generated by the far right and pro Kremlin left. Um, I, I don't know what hate speech we're sp spreading. Uh, I, I don't know who we're threatening. I guess we're threatening his worldview. He weirdly stopped uh, blocking me and started following me around this time. I don't know if he has something planned or, 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 or he, he's, he's up to something, but it's, it's very, and you, this is a very explicit call to the manager uh, to shut us down just because of our opinions, not because we're spreading disinformation. Yeah, and I'd love to know what he wants. As you say, it'd be great if you could explain what we are saying that is false and that is hate speech. They never do. They call us names and they call for us to be silenced, but they don't lay out why we're allegedly saying anything wrong because the point is they can't. They can't challenge us on the facts so they need to come up with claims about us that were linked to Russia or some other bad guy state and whatever else. And yeah, I wish Paul Mason was here to explain for himself what state action he wants to take against this because I invited him on on my show pushback to discuss it with me, but he declined. But um, it'd be great to know what kind of state action he wants to see taken. And 
maybe he'll explain more. But yeah, this is and he and the funny thing about him is he claims to be on the left while he's leading wars and uh, he's leading rallies inside of the UK where he lives in favor of the proxy war in Ukraine. He wants to arm Ukraine even more, and he wants to silence us for providing a dissenting point of view on that. 